topic again is the dream and you know you think about how most of us go through our lives and, and, and like Thoreau said you know most men live uh, lives of quiet desperation and I think that's really true for most people and they're just wanting to be somebody who wanted to make it and uh, um, you know most people never had the opportunity to have other people in a, such a large group like this make them feel the way you made me feel and I hope that some of you will just have the guts to, to you know to, to tough through the tough times and get it going so that someday you can experience what that feels like because I think every one of you deserves to feel that way uh, if you do the work necessary to make that happen and it's uh, it's just, it's really indescribable it's hard to describe how that feels and um, I just just hope that you all do what you need to do to make your to, to feel that someday. Well, anyways, let me just talk to you a little bit about um, how to get there. You know what the dream means, and and uh, there's two ways to get there. There's full or part time. You know, when I first started, I was part time. If it wasn't if it wasn't for part the, 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 that we had part time here at, at PFS, I don't know that I would have ever got started here. I was making fifty five thousand dollars a year. I was in the retail jewelry business. I was like tw I was twenty five, twenty six years old when I was making that kind of money, and uh, I had the house and the home, uh, the cars and all that, and a lot of obligations like we all do. And if they would have told me, Hector, you've got to quit your job, go full time and get right into this thing, I would have said thanks but no thanks. I don't care how good it sounds, I'm not leaving the security of my of my job. I've been doing that for a few years. I'm good at it. I know that I can make money doing that and this is a iffy kind of thing. And but they didn't say that. They said, Hector, you can start part time. You can do it at your own time. You know, I used to manage a jewelry store, so I used to work real weird hours. My only days off were Monday and Wednesday. So that was really the only chance I had a, had to do the business and and so I did it when I was able to do it. You know, so a lot of you are coming in here and you're thinking, well when am I going to fit it in? You know when you fit it in, you fit it in when you can fit it in. And you make it go little by little and you, and you work it in as you go and is it if the, if the business makes more sense as you progress then you then you find ways to commit more time to it. Does that make sense? That's what you do, you know. So however much time you can commit, commit that. And if it's a lot then great, you'll go quicker and if it's a little then you, you'll find some way to make that grow as time goes on. Uh, I had a you know, one thing, I, I also, if they would have said I had to go full-time, I don't know if I ever would have, because when I first got involved, I didn't look at this as a as what it's turned out to be. I looked at it as a way to pay off some credit card debt. I don't know if any of you have any credit card debt, but I had about $6,000 in credit card debt, and I looked at this as a way to pay that debt off, because as I noticed every time I made the the, the, uh, the uh, payments on that thing, the balance never went down. Have you noticed that yet? When you make those credit card payments, the balances never go down, and I said, you know, i got to get rid of that so I can start saving some money. Uh, and so I, 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 it really helped me to get started like that. So it's one of the great parts of, of doing this business. You can, I, another thing is you can even reach your dreams part-time. I have a part-time guy who's been part-time, who's probably never go full-time. His name's Joe Moscola, and he's been with me since almost the beginning. He saved about $300,000 in this business part-time over the last 10 years. 300, a part-time guy. Now, he's going to be financially independent, right? So he, he is realizing the dream of PFS, either part-time or full-time. So any way you look at it, if you're committed and you're diligent, you can do that, and that's really exciting. You know, one of the things that makes this thing really exciting also uh, is there are no limits or restrictions. You understand that, do you understand that in almost everything else we do from an employment standpoint, there are some limits and some restrictions, but here there aren't any. There are absolutely none, all but the ones we place on ourselves. You know, those are the only limits and restrictions. You know, if you want to make an extra 500 or a thousand dollars a month, well, tear it up. If you want to make a million dollars a month, you can do that here. You understand? A lot of you don't, maybe don't understand the compensation system yet. But this is, I'll give you a little inkling, because this is what I, my plans are right here. If you have, you, we get a 30% override on first generation RVPs, okay? So if you produce an RVP, like Rick Susie is, is my best RVP, right? He does about, this last month he did $60,000 in his base shop last month. Well, what is 30% of 60,000? It's 18,000, that's right. Gary got that one down, right? 18,000, okay? Now, now think about this, if you have, if you have 100 RVPs doing, say, $30,000 a month that are first generation to you, what does that work out to? About $3 million, right? Well, what's 30% of $3 million? It's 900000 okay? And that doesn't include your seconds, thirds, fourths, fifths, and all the other things that go with that. Why couldn't you, over your career, develop 100 first generation RVPs? Why can't you? What would prevent you from doing that? The only thing that would prevent you is the way that you think and your inability to keep working and doing the things necessary for that to happen. 
Do you understand that? You can do that. It might, it might take you 20 years or 25, but so what? We're going to work anyways, right? I'm, 20, I'm 36 years old. I, gotta, I think i got about 40 good years in me of work here, okay? I mean, I know that's going to happen. I don't know when exactly. I, uh, my goal is the year 2000, but it might maybe to the year 2005 or 10. So what? What a bummer, right? <laughs> the fact is that you can do that. You know, if you want to expand internationally, right now I started my office in my business back in 1984, I was part-time. I didn't even recruit my first person. I'll tell you, I got exposed to PFS in 1981. Filled out my hiring pack and never turned it in. Never went and took my exam. Paid my fees and everything. I got re-recruited again in March of 83. Turned in my hiring pack. I actually went and sat for my exam, passed the exam. I got licensed in May of 83. Never wrote a sale, never went to a meeting, never did anything until January of 84. That's when I got started. And then I didn't have my first recruit, my first Asian, until July of 84. And then I went full time in October or, no, or November of that same year. So, you know, some of you, it, it doesn't, timing is everything in our business. If you just keep going. And then from that, uh, it took me a, a, almost two years to become an RVP from that point forward. And then from that point, I opened my own office. After I'd been an RVP for almost two years, I finally opened my first office. And when I opened my first office, my first meeting that I had, that we had our whole team, I had 36 people there. Man, we're having about 3,000 people a week out to op meetings now in my organization. My business now, grown out was one little office that I struggled and I was afraid. Can I make the pain, the you know, monthly payments? I'm now was nervous. Can I be a leader? All those kinds of things that everybody feels. I felt those things. But I just kept on going. I had faith. You know what? Some point you gotta believe that God's gonna take care of you. You do the things you need to do. So I had some faith, you know, and I kept going. And, and now we have five offices in, in, in Phoenix, in Tucson, Arizona, in Las Vegas, Nevada, in Reno, in Idaho, in uh, uh, West Virginia. We're going into New York right now. We're in, we're in, uh, we're in uh, Washington, the state of Washington, Oregon, uh, Canada. I have offices in Vancouver, in Winnipeg. We have, we're all over the place. We've got things. Good. And you know what? I didn't even start those things. Those are people I just got involved here and built and developed people here, and they knew people in other places, and we just kind of expanded. I don't have anything to do with that ha happening. That's the beauty, the dream of this thing, and it can expand. You can go international. Where as soon as Mexico opens up, you can believe your bottom. No, we're going to have tons of people in Mexico, and and then you know, we're going to we're going to go into it, we're going to be going into Europe real soon. They've already started all the arrangements to go into the United Kingdom, and then Asia is not too far behind. Do you understand where this is going to be? Don't think about this month or this year. How about five years and ten years and twenty years? You all going to have to be doing some anyways, right? Man, why not be part of something like that? We're going to be all over the world. I mean, we're going to be times where you, you're going to have friends and meet people and be able to help people in, in continents all over this, this whole world. I mean, it's going to be what a thrilling life. Can you imagine that? Being able to help people and do that kind of thing all over the world. Imagine the different experiences you're going to have. The, it's just, man, I, if, I wish you could be in my body just for a second to feel the excitement. I mean, what's going to happen here? I mean, it's so doggone exciting. You know, the other great thing about this is you decide how far you want to go, man. You know, I, I, I know this. God gave us free will and choice. You understand that? That's one of the gifts that he gave us to decide what we want to do with our time here. Why not? Why would you settle for being average and mediocre? That's not his intent. That's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to do something special to develop ourselves, to do more, to push ourselves, to become all we can be while we're here. That's, that's what we're supposed to do here, you know? And you can do that. You can help a few people. Maybe you don't have the guts to keep going. You know, everybody's at a different stage in their life, right, in their development. That's okay. But you can help a few people, or you can have thousands, or you can help millions. You get to decide that. Yeah, I hope you're understanding. Uh, this is really can happen to you. I mean, a guy like me from where I came from, what's happening and changing my life right now, I know how some of you feel. I know you're nervous. I know you're scared. The reason I keep saying that because I was scared every doggone day I got up. But somehow I just kept doing it, and that's what you're going to have to do if it's going to happen for you. Well, I hope you get, you get that, that sense that I'm trying to uh, uh, get to you right now. Hey, listen, the other thing is exciting. You decide how far you want to go with this thing. You decide. You know, it's not up to your supervisor or your manager 
or your previous experience or your resume or your college that you go to the right college did you go to Laverne College that nobody ever knew about or did you go to Harvard nobody cares that I went to Laverne it's a little you know podunk school here in Southern California who cares I, I mean it doesn't matter right I mean you look at that I mean we just looked at, I was looking at the paper a couple weekends ago I mean my income right now where I'm at I'm just getting going I'm one of the like the top 10 or 15 highest paid CEOs in the state of California and nobody even knows who the heck I am you know You have it. It doesn't matter where you belong. You don't have to belong to country clubs. You don't have to have. None of those things are important here. The only thing that's important is, is is what you decide to be important. What you decide to make it. That's what's important. And um, you, you know, you decide. And that to me is the most exciting part. You know, when I was growing up, uh, I'm a reader. I want to really encourage you that if you don't read to start reading and if you and, and and don't tell me well I'm not a good reader you know that's I don't really enjoy it well learn how to be a doggone good reader I mean you know change that's part of the whole thing of, of evolving you know the only reason is maybe you didn't have the basic skills when you were young you didn't learn them right you can learn those even if you're 25 or 45 or 55 man there's so many great things that you can put you know because thoughts are things the things that you think about is what what, what makes up your life and if you're th the more things the more positive things the more great things you can put into that brain of yours the more exciting the more things can can open up to you in your life it's really important I want to encourage you to read to, to learn to to get better in every area so that you can start thinking about some of those things that are possible out there for you see you're only uh, limited by your desire or commitment I think uh, you know, we all have some desire in you. I mean, there's no question in my mind that every one of you wouldn't be here. It was raining. I don't know about you. When I came here, it was about 10 or 15 wrecks on the way in here, right? So you had to have some desire to get here to make it here this morning, right? And uh, so you have some desire. I know that. Or else you wouldn't take up a Saturday when you could be doing some other things. You could be watching cartoons right now or eating pancakes and a lot of other things, right? But you're, you're here this morning. You're not doing those things. You made a decision. Um, and you made a commitment to be here. You know, some of you make, you know, you told people you'd be here. You probably didn't even want to be here, but you made a commitment and you stuck by your commitment. Those of you, I'm proud of you. I mean, I, I think that's a, that's a shine, sign of integrity to do that. Because a lot of people, a lot of people made commitments to you that they were going to be here and they're not here, are they? I mean, you know what I'm talking about, right? You know what you need to do? You need to help those people. You know, those people have a challenge making commitments. You need to follow up with them. You need to, you know, call them in, in a loving way, in a caring way, help them to, to, to see this thing. They're, maybe their timing wasn't good for them. They weren't just right. Don't give up on those people. Man, if they would have given up, imagine that first guy that recruited me in 1981 who stopped. Uh, is he, is he think he's, he's in my organization now, but, but I know he's sick right now, okay? <laughs> He, you know, so don't quit. You don't know what's inside of a heart or a man or a woman. Nobody knows that. No, don't ever judge. You know what? We are not, we're not capable of judging people. Do you, you know that? We aren't capable. You should never judge people. Never judge people because you don't know what's inside of people. You know, here, the greatest thing to me that was so exciting, you know, because I, I was saying when I was a kid, I was a dreamer. I used to read a lot. I grew up in a pretty tough, in Chino, in, 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 in a, you know, it's a pretty much all Hispanic neighborhood, you know, and it was not a, I mean, I saw some things that, that you should, probably shouldn't see when you're a kid, you know, and, um, but I was fortunate, I grew up close to a library, about a block and a half away, and I, and I used to have my friends I used to run around with and carouse with and, you know, do the things you do when you're a kid, right? And then I had my library friends, and I used to go to the library, all the, all the nerds, right? I mean, I was a nerd, too, when I was a kid, and we, I used to really like being with those people and reading books and talking and stuff like that, and, I, and, and my friends that I used to play baseball and football with didn't know I used to do that, but I used to do that, and I used to read, and I, and I, lo I developed a love of reading, and I used to read autobiographies of, of sports heroes. That's what that was my thing. I've read, you know, hundreds and hundreds of autobiographies. I really get a kick out of it. And I found out, I started becoming a dreamer when I was a kid, when I was 8 and 10 and 12 years old and 14 years old. I was a dreamer. I thought, you know what, if you work hard enough, you can do anything. I had faith. I had belief that you could do that. You know, I, I didn't think, you know, well, I, why try? I mean, I didn't, I, thank God, I didn't ever have those feelings, you know. And so when I saw this, I thought it was possible. The thing that's preventing most of you from really being successful is you have a lot of doubt. 
You understand? That's, the, that's what's the difference between maybe the people that you see here that are successful and you is the doubt is just, just, just kind of it's hurting you, all right? I mean, you've got you to gotta start having more faith and belief in what's capable. So I read those things, and I thought you could do it if you worked hard. I never for a second thought that it was going to take tremendous commitment and sacrifice and work on my part. I never for once thought it was going to be an easy road. I never even wanted it to be easy, you know? I just go, man, if there's a chance, and when I saw this, I saw there is a chance for me to make it, you know? And I hope some of you are seeing that right now. Don't be afraid of the tough parts. Don't be afraid. Those things are there to help you develop and grow and develop the skills and the things necessary for you to lead other people along the trek. That's what they're there for. They're not there just to, to, to aggravate you. They're there for a doggone reason, and look at them as that. It's, it, all of the challenges you have is the way that you look at them. They're not challenges for the sake of challenges. They're challenges for a chance for us to grow and to develop and to become more so that we can help other people along that trek. So look at those things with, and, and embrace them. Don't, don't try to run from them push it away. Uh, you know, um, we're really limited by our thoughts. You know, that's one of the things I'm working on really hard with my organization. And I've got a base shop right now. I've got some great people in my base shop. You know, I want to challenge you guys right now. I mean, like John Raymond and Jack Solomon and Kurt Joyner and, and Melanie Bersigno and some of these people that are really, you know, Edward Gardo Camacho. I mean, you know, we need to change your thinking. You need to start thinking bigger. You need to start thinking everything's possible instead of all of what everybody else thinks that everything's impossible and it's too hard. That's crazy thinking, you know? That's not the way you want to think. I think that's the thing that separates the people that really make it and don't make it is the way they think. As I sit back here, I'm, I'm sitting here talking to some of the people that are super successful. You think some of those people are different than you. They're not different from you. They think a little different, but they're not. Don't ever be intimidated by people that are doing well. All they did is they learned some things that you haven't learned yet, and when you learn them, you're going to be as successful as you want to be. Don't ever look at people as intimidating, okay? Don't ever do that. You know, and finally, you get to control your own destiny. You know, it, you know it finally, there's, you're looking at an opportunity for you to control your destiny, where you end up, where your family ends up, where your children end up, where your, you know, where your grandchildren end up. You know, we have a choice. Sometimes we look at this as just a business as a means to end. I hope you don't look this at, at this as just a means to an end, but a way that, 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 that you can really do some impact and some, have some great impact on the people that you, you know, you come across as you go through this journey called life, you know. I, I, I want to talk to you a little bit about the dream. What, is this, what, is, what really happens when you, build a, when you pay the price to build a business, when you put the hours in to make it happen, when you do some of the things that, that, uh, that I look back that seem it's crazy when I was doing them, but I knew, you know, there was times when I was building my business, I don't recommend you do all these things, but I was willing to do whatever I had to do to make it go. You know, a lot of times people think, well, that Hector, he sure is lucky he found Rick Susie. Well, you didn't know I had to call him for 18 straight months, did you? Okay. I mean, well, he was really lucky. He just found Gary McCrone right next door to him. Well, Gary wasn't that receptive in the early stages. I tried to get him involved in 10 different things before I got him in here. He thought I was a flake, you know? I mean, you don't know all the things, the challenges. When I first got involved in the business initially, uh, you know, my wife thought I was nuts. She just thought I was trying to get out of the house so I wouldn't have to be around her and the kids and when they were little, you know? I mean, she really thought those things. I mean, there was a lot of challenges for Hector Lamarcus to build his business. It wasn't a piece of cake. You know, there were times when I was, uh, uh, Rick Susie hired a guy named Dave Harrison in, Sac in the Sacramento area, and I flew up there to meet him to see if I'd work with him. Rick wasn't even licensed yet at that point, okay? And I flew up there, and I made a commitment. I really liked uh, Dave. I thought he was the kind of guy that I could work with. And I flew up to Sacramento for 11. I wasn't making a lot of money then, folks. That was in 1986. I was just barely getting, starting to get my biz going. In fact, in 86, I only made 86000 And this was before I was really making any real money. I flew up to Sacramento. <laughs> I flew, up, I, I flew up to Sacramento and, for 11 straight weeks, and I didn't know Dave Harrison. I flew up to Sacramento, slept on his couch. I'd get there on Wednesday morning, start working and training him, right? So, you know, go out and see people, and then I'd fly back on Friday morning, I, it was sleeping on a, at a stranger's home on a strange couch just so I could get this doggone business going. I wasn't going, well, I'll do this, but I won't do that, because like a lot of you are that, that are doing that right now, I didn't care. You understand? I was looking down the road. I was looking at what was going to happen in my life if I made the commitment. I Man, I used to I had an organization in um, um, Arroyo Grande. You know what that area is? What, what's um, 
Santa Maria. I had, we hired some people in Santa Maria, and I used to do the same thing. I'd, I'd drive up there on Sunday, stay with uh, Sam and Bannig, you know, and, 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 and work with them and stuff. And then on Monday nights, we rent a little uh, hotel room, and I'd take my, my uh, overhead with me, and, and, and we'd try to do an you know, opportunity meeting. And I, did, I used to do that, I did that week after week, and there were some nights I'd drive, it took a three and a half to four hour drive from my home. I'd drive up there, no one show up. No one would show up. It happened to me probably three or four or five times. No one, would, no new people, all old people. Then I had to be excited, man, this is the greatest business on earth. And then inside I'm thinking, oh my God, I can't believe I'm doing this, you know? And, uh, but I, you know, I never let anybody know that. See, I never let anybody know that I was hurting. I never let anybody know. I believed that if I just kept going and doing the things necessary, it was gonna happen. And you know, I'd be driving home, I'd be so tired because I had to drive back because I had an op meeting the next day and I'd have to pull over at a Denny's and sleep in the Denny's parking lot for a couple hours so I wouldn't crash on my way. I mean, you know what I'm talking about? I'm not trying to let you know I walked uphill to school in the snow and, and back home uphill in school. I mean, I'm not trying to say that. But what I'm trying to say is that when you're committed, you're committed, right? You do what you need to do to make it happen, right? There's no limitations, there's no barriers on what you gotta do, you just do it. And because uh, I knew what was going to happen, because I believed in what was going to happen, I believed that was going to happen to me. I, I believed that, so I kept on doing everything and anything I could do to make it happen. And what happens? The reason I'm saying this is that hopefully some of you'll hear this and say, you know, I'm always saying I'll do anything, but then when it comes down, I don't. Well, folks, you got to, you got to, not forever, for just in, just long enough to get it going, long enough to see people, let people know you're totally committed. You're not going anywhere. You're a pillar of strength that you're going to be there. People around you need to see that about you in, or, in order for them to follow you and have faith in you because almost everybody's scared to death and they're so security conscious. If they see you wavering, they're going to have a challenge following you. I didn't want anybody to see me wavering, not for a second, regardless of how I felt inside. And so I kept doing that. And let me tell you what happened as a result of doing that, because there's, there's, a, there's a, a kind of a pot at the end of the rainbow. There's financial independence for your family, the thing that a lot of you are dreaming about. You know, the schools of your choice. Both my kids are, are in the best private schools that, they're pot, that there are in the area that I live. I, my, my son's going to school called Webb. I mean, it's like $13,000 a year. He's in high school. He's a freshman in high school. You know, my, my daughter's going to go there. I mean, I'm going to end up spending about $25,000, $30,000 a year to put my two kids through high school. But you know, it didn't matter because it's the best high school. And I work my tail off so I can put them in the best high school. Some of you would think that's crazy. No, it's not crazy because you can't afford it. Hey, the other, the greatest thing is, is I worked really hard. Is there some, is there some times when I didn't see my kids and my wife like I wanted to? Absolutely, I'm not gonna sit here and lie to you. Of course there were some times when there was some sacrifice when I'd rather be with them than out on a training sale in Sacramento. Of course there was. But it was a long-term picture, you know? If you're gonna go back to school to be a doctor, right? Are you gonna sacrifice? Are you gonna be, you know, not see your family because you're gonna be studying and stuff, right? For a chance to make it, right? Of course, that's the way it is in this country, in this world. There are some sacrifices, but there's some rewards, you know. The time to enjoy your family, I, have, I get a chance, I see my kids whenever I want to. I pick them up from school, and I, we do things together. I mean, I mean, I see my wife every day. My typical day when I get up, other than Monday morning, is I go work out with my wife. We go to the gym, work out, and then after we work out, we go deposit some money at the bank, and then we, and then we, and we, go, to, we go to breakfast, you know. And we do that just about every day unless something else is coming up. I, spend, I, I pamper my wife. I take care of her. I love being around her. I worked hard so that I could be around her whenever I wanted to. Hey. I have a son that loves baseball. My son loves baseball. He's a baseball fanatic, you know. I mean, he was, that's all he lives for is baseball. He loves it, you know. He's a great student and stuff, too. But he loves baseball, and he wanted to be a pitcher. You know, my son's not... Um, he's, he's not really fast, but he's really smart. I mean, it's hard. I mean, not physically fast, right? And um, so he wanted to pitch. So what do you do when he wants to pitch? You find somebody that can teach him how to pitch. Because I never, I didn't pitch. I was, a, I was a second baseman and a shortstop. You know, I didn't know how to pitch, right? But I, so what I did, there's a guy named Frank Pastore. Maybe some of you know him. He used to pitch for the Reds. He pitched for the Reds for, for 11 years in the big leagues. And he lives near me. And so I hired Frank to teach Dak how to pitch. He's been giving Dak pitching lessons every week. 
And man, he is getting good. Boy, you see that curveball drop, man, hitters lunging. It's so exciting to see that happening, you know? He's doing awesome. He's, his team's in first place. He's, I, I mean, he's the, at least the, the, the first or second best pitcher in the league. I mean, he, you know, there's some kids that are more talented than him. You know that? Physically, I've seen them. But you know what? They don't have, their parents don't have the resources to put them in lessons so they can compete at that. You know what I'm saying? Isn't that sad? I'm glad I made that decision to get this thing going. I know Dak's glad I made that decision to get this thing going. You know, you look at, at my, my daughter, she's a, she loves art, you know, she loves to draw, she loves anything creative, you know, we send her to art school, we do whatever, you know, whatever she wants to do, we really, we, we, it's great, you can do great things for your kids, you can encourage them, you know, for your parents, some of you have parents still, you're fortunate that your parents are still alive, I'm fortunate my parents are still alive, they work very hard, my parents uh, uh, struggled their whole life, I mean, they raised seven kids, and it was, you know, basically labor type jobs, and, and my, my wife's parents worked hard their whole life too, they didn't have a lot of money, neither one of them did, and now we're able to do some really great things, like we've decorated their homes, and, and, and we've, uh, we have gardeners for them, and we have, you know, we take care of them, we take them on world-class vacations every year for, since we started making some money in this movie, we've taken them on a world-class vacation every single year and we I mean world-class I mean world-class when we go to Hawaii with them we don't stay at one of those condos that has a kitchen and then you buy your own groceries and cook we don't do that okay we go and we stay at the uh, Hyatt Regency the, on Wailea or, or at, in Kanapali and it's everything that, with ocean views because we don't go well it's an extra fifty or hundred dollars a night so we don't want to do the ocean view forget that it's ocean view you know what I mean and the restaurants are the right places. And our parents would never have had a chance to experience those things. You know, just this, the other day was Mother's Day, right? And we, I was so excited about Mother's Day, you know? And, you know, because what we were doing for our mother, our mothers on Mother's Day, we, 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 uh, we went to Mother's Day and we gave our parents, um, our moms and our, both of our moms, uh, we're taking them on an Alaskan cruise. That was their Mother's Day gift, an Alaskan cruise, you know, and not, not just sending them, we're going with them, okay, with our kids. <laughs> and, you know, and the other great, probably even better than that is that I'm, I know for, I know my parents and Jan's parents never have to worry about economics, ever. Uh, ever. They never have to worry about anything comes up, and, you know, uh, financial, if, whether it be that they get sick or, you know, the cost gets too high. They're never going to have to worry about that with me here. They're, they ain't going to worry about that. I'm taking care of everything. So, so they can have a retirement. Of, 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 you know, enjoy their grandchildren, enjoy themselves, not be stressed out about, you know, what they're going to do. I mean, you know, there's a lot of people that are elderly that, you know, it's so unfortunate they're having to do things that, you know, they would never dreamed in their, in their million years that they're having to do, like work at McDonald's. You know, you ever notice how many older people are working at McDonald's? I mean, that's not funny. That's, that's sad. That shouldn't happen to anybody's parents. You know, um... You get to change your children's expectations. My children's expectations are so far removed from what my expectations were. I mean, the things that they talk about and think about. My, my daughter said the other day, we were just talking, and she goes, um, I don't know, we were talking about work and about getting things going. She goes, so, we're, so, so what are you, you going to do, Janae? Are you gonna, you know, what kind of job are you going to get? You know? That was a, a Freudian slip. That was a dumb thing to say, right? She goes, a job? What am, a job? What would you have a job for? I don't want a job. This is my, she's 13 years old. I don't want a job. You know why people have do jobs, Dad? Because they need to be told what to do. That's why they have jobs. <laughs> my 13-year-old daughter. Now, I know a lot of you have jobs, and I'm not putting that down because I had a job, too, but I made a choice to get out of that job, okay? But her thinking, that's the key, see? She's not thinking about being an employee. She doesn't want to. What, why be an employee when you're in America when you don't have to be an employee? You can choose to be an owner, right? Ownership. Why would you ever be an employee when you don't have to be? They expect great things. They expect to win, you know? They just expect to win. They, they're positive. They're, you, you, you can't be around us for very long and be a negative person. You don't fit in. You're like a, you know, a square pig in a round hole. You feel very exposed when you're around us, when you're negative. I don't like negative people around me. I don't like them around my kids. I don't like them around my people. I don't like people that are negative. It's not that I don't like them. I don't like being around them. I think they got a challenge, you got to work out. And this is a great place, to, it's a great environment to rear your family in, where everybody's positive. When they come over, it's, hey, how you doing? How things going? It's not like, 
Well, did you hear what uh, Clinton did today? And ding, 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 right? I mean, it's like I don't like Clinton any more than most of you do, okay? But you know what? He's he's trying to do his best, right? We got to get bigger so that that we don't get another person like that in there again. That's all. Now I know. I know, I know there are some Clinton supporters in here. I, I realize that, and that's okay too. But you know what? We're in America where everybody has a free, you know, a, they can voice their opinions. And I have to be at the podium right now, which is a really exciting part of doing this business. God bless him, though. I hope he does a great job. I hope he turns this thing around because there's a lot of people hurting out there and want to help those people too. And that's what, our, that's what we're about, right? Hey, but you know what? Your kids are going to grow up someday, and they're going to have their own lives. They're going to have their own agenda. But you're going to be with your spouse, hopefully, forever. I mean, that couple is for I expect to be my wife forever. I mean, I don't ever want to have anybody else in my life but my wife. And uh, and I was really concerned. You know, I was really concerned I, 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 that that my wife. You know, when, I, when she woke up in the morning, that she didn't turn over and take a look at me and go, oh my God, what did I do? You know, I didn't want her to feel like that. I wanted her to go look at me and say, thank you, God, for putting me with this man. That's the way I wanted her to feel about me. I didn't want her to feel like she made a mistake. I wanted her to feel like she did the, I mean, it was the best thing that ever happened to her. And you know, that doesn't happen just because you show up and you sit in front of the TV and pop open a beer and watch some, a game. You know, you got to do something with your dog on life. I mean, you got to show that you stand for something and accomplish something. And I, and I worked really hard. And there's a lot of times in this year, I, 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 most of what I do in this business, I do for her. I really do. I mean, I, I think all of us, if you're a man or you're a woman, your partner's the most important thing in your life to you uh, right here on earth, right? And you want to do everything to make them feel better and please them and make them be, feel proud of you. And so I want to take, take care of my wife. I mean, I would say that's something that's, that to me is important, okay? I mean, she's, a, she's an independent. She knows what she's doing. She's great, you know? But, you know, I have this need where I want to take care of her. And I know some of you feel that way. And um, so I have taken care of her. All the stuff we've gone through, we've been through some, some challenging times that we've been married now. We just had our 15th year anniversary the other day. And uh, we've done some great things. I'll tell you a little bit about what I did for my 15th in just a second. But you know, I, got a, I have a maid for it. It, it. You know, when you stay in a hotel, don't you love staying in hotels? Like you go there, you, like, you mess everything up, you dirty the towels, and you leave everything strewn around, and the bed's all in disarray, right? And then you go out and do your thing, you come back in the evening, and everything's perfect again, right? It's all made up, you're, everything hung up, and there's new, fresh towels. I know you like that. That's how my life is every day. I have a maid, we have a I got my wife a maid, and she's, un she's an unbelievable, I mean, she's awesome. Patty is just the best. It's great, you know, when you, you know, you, you take your clothes off, you go into the room, and you do some other things, you come back, everything's washed and pressed and ironed back in your closet again. I mean, that is awesome. I mean, that is a, right? I mean, you, you, you women that do the wash, or you men that do the wash, you know what I'm talking about. Not having to ever do that again, to have that trivial thing taken care of, right? And, and, help, and, have some, and offer some employment to somebody so they can do that. You understand that? That's a positive thing too. You're probably thinking, well that poor maid, that poor maid gets paid. She got about 13, 14, 15 weeks a year paid vacation because I'm hardly ever home. I mean she's got the best job on earth. I built her a, we built a, I built her a custom 8,000 square foot home, you know, custom decorated. Exactly. Some of the people have been there. It's, it's really nice. I mean it really is. It's, a, it's one of those picture perfect kind of place. It's awesome. I love it. I, love, I can't believe I live there. Tennis court, swimming pool, everything. Full length basketball court. It's got the, everything. It's a great place. A great place to have your kids grow up in. You know? Some of you say, you spoil those kids. That's right. I do spoil those kids. But they deserve it. They earned it, man. They're, they're great kids. You know, my... I got her, I, you know, we have a little retreat place. We got a, a nice little 4,000 square foot uh, home on the 13th hole of uh, the, uh, the uh, Nicholas Private at PGA West. With, uh, as you walk in the front door, it's all glass. We have a rock pool with the waterfall coming down, you know, it's really awesome. And then you look at the mountains and the fairway and there's a lake right there. And that's where we go on the weekends to get away, you know, from the stress of our daily life. <laughs> We have that option, you know? 
And, um, you, you know, we get to, you know, like yesterday at the break, just the little things. See, you know, we had fun yesterday. We spoke yesterday, and we went. I don't know if you've ever been to Laurie's in Beverly Hills, but they just moved from across the street there in La Siena. If you ever a chance to go eat there, it's a great place, one of the great restaurants in the country. And we just went, let's go Laurie. So we go there. We had a great meal in between. We had enjoyed ourselves, and it was just awesome, you know, to be able to do those things, to be able to read the menu from left to right instead of right to left. You know what I mean? I mean, that's a, that to me is a big pleasure because when I was growing up, I never, my parents never took us to restaurants. Now, I never went to restaurants when I was a kid. We could not afford to go to restaurants. My dad said, oh, you don't want to go to restaurants. The restaurants are no good. The food's not good. Home food's better. What he's really saying, son, we can't afford to take you to the restaurants. We've got to eat at home. Right? I mean, that's, that's what those people do. That and, um, and and it's a it's a nice way. You know, also you think about somebody. Uh, I was listening to a, a tape of. Um Eric Denton, who's a pastor of a church that we support, and, and, and I was listening to him, he was talking about when he was growing up, that when he was a kid, uh, he would, uh, right, you know, like right before Christmas, they'd look through the Sears catalog and pick out the things they wanted. You ever remember doing that, looking through the catalogs when you're a kid, I want this, I want this, and, you know, putting the pages down and marking them and all that stuff, and hopefully you'd get some of those things, and you'd wake up and you got one of the 25,000 things you wanted or something like that, you know, and, and, and now... You can do that. Whatever it is that you want to do, you can do. It's an incredible feeling of freedom. Now, you don't do everything, but you can, you know? I mean, and it's a, it's a great thing, way to be. And, um, and the bottom line, though, really, is we talk about, you know, the financial things, and all those things are wonderful, and those are things that you can enjoy, but that's not really what this is about. See, the really thing that makes this thing special is that every one of us is doing everything in our power to feel better about ourselves. That's what we do, you know, from the things we buy, like the clothing we wear, to the cars we drive, to the homes we, you know, all the things. We're always trying to make ourselves feel better because most people just don't feel good about themselves, you know. They're, they're searching for a way to do that. And, and the bottom line is that this is a business that can help you feel better about yourself. If you achieve and you do things and you help other people, nothing makes you feel better. That, that I read off some of the names of the people that are doing really well in our organization right now. Nothing is more gratifying to see those people achieving in their life and making it. I know it's a struggle for them a lot of times. I know they, they're, they're sometimes, I was just talking to Gary right now. He, was, he, he's, he did $170,000 in his hierarchy last, uh, last month. And, you know, he put out $35,000, $40,000, and he still doesn't feel like he's making it man he's making it like you can't believe right now he he's gonna do his life is is gonna be unbelievable and to see him where he came from where he was having to sell everything when he was unemployed and had a, a busted up leg he won a bunch of things on the prices right and he was selling TVs and I bought a stereo from him and exercise equipment and all that just to make his house payment and today where he's at and what he's able to do and the things that he's acquired and the lifestyle that he's able to afford his family now that is unbelievable that those kinds of things happen in this life and I had a part in that you know I had a part I didn't do the work he did all the work but doggone it I played a part you know in that thing it's exciting to be able to do that but more exciting than that for me is the way I feel about me today. See, there was a time when I didn't feel great about me. There was a time when I didn't, when I was not what I was, I wasn't doing everything. I knew it. I knew that I was kind of just getting by and, and everybody thought I was doing well and it looked on the surface that I was doing well. I was making 55000 a year and I had a nice little home in a cul-de-sac in a nice little neighborhood, right? And, and my wife worked and I had two little kids and they were doing good and they were dressed and, you know, we weren't broke, but, but I, you know, I didn't feel great about me. I knew I could do more than what I was doing. I knew that I hadn't yet committed to something like I could commit to something. And I didn't feel great about Hector Lamarck. Man, and you need to feel great about yourself. And then when I saw this thing, I said, Hector, you got to commit. You got to make this thing happen. And you got to do it. You know, you got to make it happen and feel great about it. And I did it. And I'm telling you, when I look in the mirror today, I feel great about me. And you know, when I feel great about me, I can be so much better to my kids, to my parents, to my wife, to the people that I come in contact with. Because, see, I'm not worrying about me. I feel good about me today. I hope every one of you will make a decision to do the things necessary to feel good about you. It is worth it. I am telling you, it is so worth it. It's indescribable. If, I could, if you could just understand how great it really is. Easy? No way. But worth it all the way. You know, I, I think back to when I first got started in the business, and uh, um, 
I remember, uh, I'm a reader, you know, I said that earlier today, and I like to read, and I like to do research, and I, that's just kind of my nature. When I, when I start to do anything, I try to find out as much as I can about it, and, and my first thing that I saw, and I, they told me how this worked, and how cash value worked, and how, you know, term insurance and investing mutual fund was a better concept. It made sense, you know, on the surface, but, you know, we all have a little bit of skepticism in, in, in each of us, right? So what I did is I went straight to the library, and I did some research. I, I, I uh, looked up all the periodicals and everything I could find about insurance. I, I went and also, you know, looked up all the different kinds of books on insurance and, and read, uh, you know, the mortality merchants, um, Scott Reynolds and Mortality Merchants, the uh, life insurance uh, s games and scams. I read a bunch, everything I could gra get my hands on. I read the Norman Dacey's What's Wrong With Your Life Insurance, the first edition that was written in 1960, I think it was three or 68 or something like that. That was actually the first book I read. The things that you're hearing here is, are not new at all. They've, they've been known for, you know, decades now. The fact is that no one is no one's ever put this information out on a wide scale basis to the American public like PFS is attempting and, or not attempting but is actually doing. And uh, when I started seeing that, I got really excited. You know, one of the things that helped me a lot in, in when I first was getting started, because a lot of you are new, I used to be in the retail jewelry business. And um, the retail jewelry business is a lot like the whole life insurance industry. I mean, we'd buy, uh, uh, you know, a ring for $250 and sell it for a thousand, you know, which is like a 400% markup. And, and, and the way I equated what I was doing here and, and what we're doing here versus what in the jewelry industry is we sold a cash value sort of jewelry product, right? And the insurance whole life is, a, is, is, is um, like uh, retail full price jewelry. It's the same type thing. And we used to do the same kinds of things to, um, and when, when, when clients came in in the jewelry business, we were taught this. This is what I taught. I didn't know any better. That's why I have a little bit, a tiny bit of compassion for the agents. The industry's really the culprit, okay, because they're leading, they're feeding this information to these new people that don't know anything about insurance. When they first get in, they, what are the, you know, let's think about yourself. When you first came in the business, what did you know about insurance? Nothing. Same thing is true when those agents first go into the industry. They don't know anything. They're taught those things by the industry, right, by their managers and whatnot. So when we'd have a client come in, to the store, right? They'd go, well, I can go to downtown LA and I think I could buy that ring for like a lot less, for maybe half or a third of the cost. And I'd go, well, you don't want to do that. I mean, you do that. I mean, you don't know if they're going to be in business tomorrow. They're, those people are fly by night. You don't know if you're going to, they're going to switch your diamond with a piece of glass. Why would you ever want to do that? We've been in business for four generations. You can trust us, right? We've been here forever. We have a jeweler on the premises. We can take care of any problem you have. I mean, you don't want to risk your, your wife's, you know, ring and, and do that, do you? I mean, come on. And we, what we would do is we would get them to be fearful of going to look at, a, at, a, at something they should buy, right? I mean, that's, that was what I was taught to do. I, I'm not proud of that. That, but that's what we did. And then when a, a wedding or, a, or a, an engagement or my wife's birthday or something came along, I'd come downtown, I'd go to the jewelry mart, I had my connections, and I'd buy the ring wholesale, right? And I'd give my wife that. I did that, okay? And so when I heard the agents were coming back to my clients and said, I said, oh, this is interesting. This is just like the, the jewelry business. See, these guys, they said, you don't want to do business with PFS, man. They, they, this guy just, you know, it was a, is a, gas, a filling station at 10. He just fell off of a turnip truck. You know, they're not going to be in business next week. You want to do business with me? I'm a career agent. I've been here for 10, 20 years. You know, we've been in business. Prudential is 120 years old. I mean, and they do all that stuff, right? Have you heard any of that stuff? And... Uh, and they sell them a, a universal life or a whole life or a variable life product, right? And charge them two thousand dollars a year for something they could have they could have got for three or four or five hundred dollars a year. And then they go and, and when they they have a new child or something, they need to increase their coverage. They go buy two hundred thousand dollars a term for about three hundred dollars a year. But they sell everybody whole life and universal life. I said, man, this is exactly like the jewelry industry. So I got excited about it. I said, thank God, now I can be in the part on the good sides part. You know, I can go in there and be bold and tell them people what's happening and do what's right and never feel embarrassed. See, I was always a little afraid of, of I didn't want to get my people that I knew that were close to me, I didn't want to sell them the products in that jewelry store. I would always recommend them to go downtown. And, and because if I saw them at a wedding or a baptismal, a birthday party or something like that, I had to face them, right? And I didn't want to have to be embarrassed. And, and when I got this, I said, you know, this is something I can do. I don't ever have to be embarrassed. I mean, when I see them anywhere, they're going to be excited that I helped them. They're going to be excited that I got them in, in term insurance. They can't do any better than that. They're going to be excited I got them in a mutual fund where they're going to get potentially 10, 12, 15, 20 percent where they were getting a negative return. You know, there's no money for the first four years, and I got really excited about that. I think you need to be proud of what you do. 
I think one of the things that will enable you to be bold and aggressive and after it and, and, and really do is to feel totally 100% confident in what you do for the consumer. If you feel with everything that's in you that you're doing the right thing, you can get after this thing. If there's a tiny bit of doubt, it's going to hurt you in your business. Not only, worst case, see, what we do is right. That's, that's a fact. That's not even arguable. See, the thing is, but that doesn't mean anything to you unless you totally 100% believe that yourself and you can get in front of people and talk to them with some doggone conviction in your heart. And when they say, no, you know, I really like my program and mine doesn't work like that and all the things that you hear instead of going, okay, well, maybe I'll call you later. Forget that news, man. No, listen, buddy, you need to see me now. You don't understand. If you knew, you'd be calling me to come see you. Come on, we need to get together. We, I, we got to do it right now. This is your whole future, man. We're talking about potentially losing tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of dollars in your, per in your lifetime. You cannot afford to not see me. I mean, you just can't afford it. You need to see me. And you need to have some doggone conviction because what we do is right. Man, and one of the greatest things is you can commit to something where you can be really, truly proud of it. I mean, that's one of the, the greatest things about PFS, in my opinion, as well as all the great things that go with it. And you think about this. Even the, the industry admits what they're, doing is, what they're doing is misleading. The CEO of Massachusetts Mutual said life insurance buyers are not getting uh, the whole story. I mean, the industry themselves say that. But you know what? The story doesn't get out enough. Even this thing that was presented, it wasn't on CNN and all the things it should have been on. It was just kind of passed through. You know, unless we get out there and tell the story, it's not going to get out there. We need to tell that story. You need to be getting excited about it. You need to become a crusader to the core. That's, an, that's the uh, super important part of your business. And sometimes people think that's corny, but you know, I don't think that's corny one doggone bit. Man, you know what? That, that was me. When I first got in the business, I had a, I had a New York Life policy. I was 20, I think I was 21 or 22 years old, 24 years old when I bought that program. I had a, two young children who were about two or three or four years old, somewhere in that range. I was spending $62 a month for $50,000 a whole life with New York Life. That guy converted a $50,000 term policy I had with State Farm that I was paying $13 a month for to $62 a whole life. And my cash value at 65 was going to be... $28,000 after, you know, 24 how many years, that's 41 years I was going to have $28,000 in cash value. Man, and you know what, they didn't want, that guy for one second did not think about Dak or Janae or Jan or any, about my, any part of my family. He wasn't thinking about that one bit. And you shouldn't be worried about going and replacing all that stuff because they weren't thinking about that consumer when they sat down with them, and you are. That's our whole, our whole basis of our business. The whole, the whole base of our business, if we can improve your, sit, your current situation, we don't deserve your business. I mean, is that a great place to come from? If we don't improve your situation dramatically, I don't deserve to ask for your business. But if we can, if we do, is there any reason why you wouldn't get involved with us? Can you see any reason why you wouldn't see your way clear to be, to be part of the PFS family? And you ask for that commitment. Don't you be shy about getting that commitment. You get it from them, and let's go tear them up.